Well, folks, welcome. Uh, I'm Jeremy Saywell. This is Zach McGraw, and we're here on behalf of the Michigan Production Alliance. Um, what we do is we're the voice of the production community. Um, we're an organization where we have industry professionals come together, students um, are part of the organization, um, and we're going to be talking more about that throughout the day. We're going to be doing a raffle later on. We're going to give away a t-shirt from the Michigan Production Alliance, so please come back, check out our other seminars. There's more information about our organization here. We're on all the different social media outlets and we do have a website. Uh, but we're gonna start out, we're gonna be learning about 360 degree photography processes and drones. And here is Zach McGraw. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks. Uh, kind of put this together last man, but. Uh, okay, so I'm a uh, professional drone pilot. I've been piloting for about three, four years now. I worked for an ad agency for a while, and now I've kind of been doing stuff on my own, and now I'm actually with a new company. So I'm going to kind of go through what I had to do to get my license and such for a drone. So um, starting out, for drone piloting, you, you have to take a test, and it's a part 107 uh, pilot test, which, like, you don't really, it, it's all up to you about what you're going to, um, like, th there's nothing to prepare you, like, they, it's kind of like, here's a few manuals, go for it, and you can take the test whenever you want, it's not like school where, like, you have homework and such, it's just like, you just have to pass the test, so, it's all discussion. Um, this was the thing that I had to look at at the beginning. This is what you actually have to know for a test. Like, I felt really overwhelmed when I first started seeing this. These are the maps you have to read. You have to know everything on it. You have to know uh, literally everything on it. You have to know different uh, radio waves. You have to know different weather patterns and such just for this one test. And uh, what actually helped is I use this thing called Drone Launch Academy, which I guess kind of forces you into like kind of schooling thing, where like it shows you, um, like you have different lessons, it teaches you different things, they update it constantly to, uh, with the new tests that come out. Uh, and they do update the tests every year, regardless. And they change different questions and such, but it's, it's pretty easy. Uh, the test, I actually went to Michigan Institute of Aeronautics in Canton, uh, and the whole test is just 60 questions, you have 120 minutes completed, and it's just, it's these maps, it's like knowing different things, um, and you have to pass it at least with a 70, it's not school where it's like you have to pass with a 60 or whatnot. So. Now flying, this was actually my first drone that I used during ad agency, which it's, it's a pretty big drone. It's in Inspire 2, and it's, I don't have it a day, it's with the agency I used to be with, but it's probably around this big. And it had a 5K camera on it, and it actually did really well. It, I got up to around 100 miles per hour on the speed test. Um, but honestly, uh, first time flying didn't go too well. I broke it. Yeah, it happens. Like when you're when you first start out flying, you're not going to. It you just kind of have to keep trying. Like you to take the test, there is no flight test. You don't have to fly anything for the test to get your license. Like everything's just a written exam. So everything's up to you with flying and um yeah i ended up crashing because i didn't think about the weather and the weather ended up uh crashing it down uh the winds were a little speedy and uh people at the agency kept telling me hey we need this sh shot today we need the shot today and i'm like it's way too windy and i ended up doing it anyway and this is what ended up happening but we, the best thing to do is get insurance, which this was through DJI because that's the type of drone is. And 
what ended up happening is we sent in and within a week they covered everything they just sent us a completely new one and I think it was around 250 bucks for a whole year but this is like a 10 grand drone so 250 bucks for a full repair of uh the only thing is you have to say it's your fault like you you have to actually take like you can't say oh something caused this to happen you actually have to say you're at fault or they won't cover it like you could just completely dive bomb it and you had they'll take it they'll take it with insurance but you have to actually say it's your fault okay so some of the things i've done um i've done like majestic theater and stuff uh I've done a lot on MACNA and I'll get to what I've done on MACNA because you actually can't fly on MACNA now, like they completely banned drones, but you, we actually had a permit to be on the island with it and we actually had to go through all their systems and stuff and we ended up getting some really cool shots and um, we actually got a lot of 360 photos from it too. Uh, and then I have like the Water Lantern Festival there and such. That was pretty cool. That was more of a fun thing for me to do. Um, but yeah, we, we've been traveling a lot. And then like one of the final products is like, this is actually a 360 tour that we've done. And like you could go anywhere in the air and there's like different locations on the island you could fly through and you could look 360 degrees around and everything. I don't think we have internet connected, so I can't really show you what it's all about. But, um, yeah, this is what I do with uh, 360. And what it does is, so what the drone does is we shoot it up in the air, and um, it takes around 30 photos, and it stays stationary and then kind of just turns, takes picture, takes picture, takes picture. We end up having to stitch it all at the end. And um, sometimes, like, uh, you can't get above the drone. Like, it can only have so much sky. So we actually usually put in a fake sky. So, like, this isn't actually, like, the real sky that goes along with it. Um, but it's kind of what we have to do. Um, I could show you guys, um, this is the drone I ended up, uh, changing to. Cause like, even though it's smaller than the last one, it, I'm sacrificing a 5k for a 4k camera, which is fine. Uh, both of them have the same flight time. The bigger Inspire 2 had a around 25 to 30 minute lifetime. This one is exactly the same. Uh, except it's just smaller. Uh, and battery, it's like the battery comes off and I could just swap it for another 30 minutes. And I have multiple, so. And then all it is is everything folds in and I carry it in my backpack. So literally I could go anywhere with it. Um, I keep this, I keep two cameras on me, a microphone just in my small backpack right here. So, um, this thing could, I think I've gone up to around 60 to 70 miles per hour. Uh, you're only legally allowed to go 400 feet above uh, ground, wherever you stand. So like if you're actually on top of a building, you're allowed to go 400 feet above that, as long as there's no flight zones or anything. And flight zones can actually be uh, looked up, and I actually have a remote for this. Uh, the remote technically comes separate, but like you can buy it with it as well. And you could actually use your phone for a drone. I don't like having a phone for a drone, though, because then it's like, you're trying to control it. What happens if you get a phone call or something? And it's like, oh, oh, um, uh, so I like having a separate uh, controller for it. And it's a lot nicer and stuff. It has a pretty big touch screen and everything with it. It has its own battery. This thing lasts about five hours on the charge. Uh, 
Yeah, so... I would recommend the controller, if anything, if you buy a drone. Um, that's pretty much it. Do we have any questions? So you say you can't fly a Mac on Island out there permit, but what if you fly a Mac on Island? What can they do? Can they arrest you? Can they compensate your drone? What's I mean, so the FAA uh, could actually compensate your license and such. Yeah. Uh, I'm not too sure about what would happen to your drone. Like, I mean, if they take it down or something or take it away from you, I don't think they will, but you could get your license revoked. So how many hours do you fly practice first before you take a the drone up and crash? <laughs> so like um, most drones, like these days, actually have sensors on them. So we have two sensors in front. I know there's a crash avoidance on there, but yeah. for you, they, they get good at being smooth, being moving around. So how many hours do you think it would take to get good at it? So honestly, it was actually, uh, with this one, I had a lot more, like easier time with this, and I, I'm i a huge gamer, and honestly this felt like a video game to me, right. because I'm just like playing on that controller. Like, I've crashed this one multiple times, like it doesn't look like it's damaged at all, and this was because I turned avoidance off. And my practice was going through the, a wooded area with avoidance off and me just controlling it. Like, I hit a few trees, but, like, um, I don't know. It's good practice, and, like, it's not like I'm playing it high. Like, I'm playing it at, like, this level, and um, this is pretty durable. Like, I haven't gotten anything replaced on this except maybe, like, a blade or two, which the blades literally just pop off, and then you can just put on a new blade, and they're, like, five bucks for a pair of four of them. So you don't have a 360 camera on there. You actually no, shoot with so that camera, and then you, you shoot, shoot with there, it. It stays that. still, and it actually goes like it takes around 30 photos. So with the program in there, you get I want to do a 360 photo, and it automatically goes where it needs to go. Yeah, exactly. Photo. We actually uh, they didn't have it programmed at the beginning, and we actually had to do it manually, where we actually had a I had a like just tilt the camera take a picture tilt the camera take a picture hopefully I don't miss a shot and have like a little blank space in the 360 but that's how it was but now it's programmed where I could just go so there's a 360 camera now that stitches by itself now you don't have to yeah the only thing about that is uh the 360 camera that stitch um sometimes they mess up with the stitching process like I I actually enjoy uh, stitching it myself, just because like um, if like say a car or boat moves in like the shot, you could kind of like edit where because there's an overlap in the 360 with the two shots, so you could kind of like uh, mask it so like you see the boat like fluently throughout instead of like having it in like two different shots that are like cut off and stuff. So I like being able to like actually do it myself, just because you can do a lot more with that and stuff. I have more of a question on the uh, part one of seven. Yeah. Is the license or certification? Is that certification or the license? It's a license. Yeah. I could actually just show you. I have my license on. Me. How often do you have to get a renewal? You have. And you go ahead. Yeah. Um, and I, I assume you have to go to a facility. Um, yeah. And where are those located? Up here? So those are actually located. Like you can uh, check the FAA website, and they'll show you whichever one's closest. The one that was closest to me was the Canton one, and that was like a forty mile radius. So, and so I'm not too sure if there are any near here. I mean, it it was a college campus, like uh, the Michigan. What was it? I can't remember, but it was, it was a specific college campus that uh, did it, and you have to actually renew your license every two years, so I actually have to go back in about a year to renew it again. Is it the same test you just go over again? Or? So the test changes every year, they might add new questions and stuff, and um, so like I was saying with the, uh, the Drone Academy that I had up there, uh, they constantly update it. It's like a one-time fee 
where it's, I think it's like 80 to 100 bucks, but like it has everything there. And I know I'm going to go back like a month before I have to retake the test to go through everything again and see what's new and such on the license. Um, so it's about $100 for the 119 for the drum launch scanning stuff. Yeah. And like you don't have to do that. Like um, on the FAA website, they actually provide all the documents and stuff. It's just like it's kind of a thing to force you to learn. Of course, uh, yeah. And they, they they do a pretty good job explaining stuff. So how long did you study for this? I studied for it. It was during me doing stuff at the ad agency too. Like I studied at the same time, so I it took me like a month. But like it was me doing actual work too and everything, so yeah, I, I give yourself like at least like two weeks though because there's like a lot of information in there. A lot of it's like reading those maps and knowing like different heights and different weather patterns and. Go ahead. Sure. Can you tell me, is this license recognized outside of the boundaries of the United States? Is there any reciprocal agreement between the United States, uh, FFA, and other Federal Aviation Administration and other countries? Or? So the license is actually only for the United States. Only for the United States. Only for the United States. So, so if you foreign <laughs> reporters and so on that come in here would have to still meet the requirements here. Yeah. Thank you. And the requirements to get a license, there, there's only like a few. You have to be at least 16 years or older. You have to, here, actually I have a few documents. Okay, so like to become an actual pilot, you have to be 16 years old, at least. You don't have to be just 16, I promise, I swear. Uh, you have to be able to read, speak, write, and understand English. Uh, you have to be in physical and mental condition to safely fly a drone, and then you just have to pass the test. That's all you need to get a license. You don't even actually have to fly anything or take any courses to fly your drone. When choosing a drone, what are some of the most important characteristics? Honestly, when I was choosing drone, like uh, the big one we had at the ad agency, uh, the Inspire 2, I thought that was actually going to be really good just because it has the camera, it has a good battery life and stuff, but I honestly enjoy the small ones. I would say get something that's portable, that has a good battery life, like this one lasts around 25 minutes on a single battery. You have 4K footage, so like, and the other camera on the bigger drone is 5K, so like going from 5K to 4K isn't too big of a deal. And the smaller one actually uh, does a lot better in the wind. Like the big one would just like shake around and clunk around. Like yeah, it has a better gimbal on it, but like it with how much wind it was like that was the reason why it crashed was the wind. And this this little one, this thing doesn't really even move around in the wind. Like it just kind of surfs around on it. So and like I said, this fits in my backpack. The other one I had to bring a suitcase along with me every time and it's like when I could carry this and two batteries and um, two cameras and everything like that's perfect for me. Did you notice much of a difference in image quality like through the lenses? No like honestly um, the only thing about the bigger drone is I could shoot like raw with 5k and stuff which I mean for some cinema stuff that would be good but I usually don't and plus the bigger one did have an SSD in it like I had a 200 gig SSD that'd be put into it but I I rather just like I have a 120 gig uh, SD card just in the drone so I think that's good enough for it honestly yeah what kind of challenges what's your biggest challenge out in the field with a drone uh, if you're you know there's airports everywhere um, how, how Far away, you have to be from the airport. So yeah, I'm not talking you know, like yeah. metro. But yeah, I know. A lot of like, smaller airports, I'm sure you have to provide that. So yeah. like, what's nice about that is on the controller and everything. Like DJI comes with it built in, where it 
like as soon as you boot it up, if you're in a zone, it'll tell you, hey, you're in an airport zone. And like on the map, it'll actually, like the maps I show you, that, okay. yeah, actually. Yeah, do you actually have a background? Yeah. Oh, like the, the actual back arrow does not work. Oh, not those. I lied. Patience. Patience. Okay. So it kind of has like a map like these, except it, it's a little less complicated than these. Like it takes off a lot of like the different numbers and stuff. Like it kind of just shows the airports. Like the airports, like with like right here is an airport. Like each different one's a flight zone and everything. Like these are class D zones. I could talk about the classes. Like you have different. Uh, Airspace here. I'm on. Are you allowed to put up a drone at all? I mean, uh, in a. In a uh, so, so for a, there's different heights. Like this is, it's one of the things you'll have to learn on the test too. Is that um, there's different heights that you could go with uh, airports and different uh, regulations. Like you might have to actually communicate with the airport or whatnot, be on the same radio with them. I've never had that problem. I've never been that close to an airport. Usually you stay around like five miles away from an airport and you're fine. Like it'll come up with a warning saying, hey, you're in an airport area. Um, you need to, do you accept all the authority and everything? And you just go like, oh yeah, okay. Yeah, I'll accept the, like if anything happens, it's my fault, so. And then you kind of, you always want like a spotter like someone who's like watching out and stuff. I mean, more than likely, if you're like five miles away uh, from an airport, you're not going to hit any planes because you can only go up to 400 feet to begin with. So there's that. <laughs> yeah. I'm... What's that? Yeah. Yeah, like it, it's. It's different, like there's different types of airspaces, like A, B, C, D, it goes all the way to like G, and then there's different restricted zones and such, so. Okay. Have you had anybody come up to you when you were out flying and say you can't be here? How did you handle that? The MACNA actually, they uh, came up to us, and I was like, oh, well we actually have a permit, and then they're like, okay. And they just backed off, and I'm like, okay. You usually people don't come up to you. Um, usually it's uh, like random strangers. They're like, oh, cool, there's a drone and stuff. That's usually what it is. But other than that, any other questions? So the story, like to be in front of the theater, you didn't have to. There is nothing there. There was a airport nearby, but it wasn't like. I wasn't in the actual area. And then you can't go by prisons, and you can't go, there's certain disruptors in some places. Like, I had a shoot at Ford Field. Like, we were going to do a drone shoot in Ford Field, and there's actually a disruptor in there that they didn't turn off on the day. And literally, if you launch your drone, they'll start going up, and then they'll just shut off and fall. So, I mean, good thing we didn't just like launch the drone up real high and then have it crash. So, uh, I know Ford Field has it and so does uh, Comerica Park. But other than that, those prisons you can't fly over and then anything that's marked on the maps, which usually you could check beforehand online or you could actually check on the controller and look up the address and see what's around. Uh, so what we had with the ad agency is we actually had a separate drone pilot that we uh, were paying and sometimes it was like he wouldn't do the right thing like I was editing the videos and I'm just like why are you doing this so I talked to my boss at the time and she's like, do you want to become a drone pilot? I'm like, sure. So I ended up uh, getting my license through them and then practicing and everything else. So. Thank you, Jack.
action. No, just compose a shot if you need to that one. All right, folks, again, my name is Jeremy Salo, and today I'm going to be talking about modern field production, changes in EFP, and how to maximize them. Some of the things I'm going to talk about today, some equipment that is necessary to upgrade, some things that you might need to update, some processes and equipment that are still applicable today. You don't need to throw away all your gear that's 10 or 20 years old or so. Uh, distribution methods and formats have changed, so we're going to go over some of that stuff importance of always learning something new and efficient ways to expand uh, and really quickly on um, some background on myself i started doing broadcasts and event videos and corporate videos uh, late 90s so my experience is going to talk about some of the productions primarily broadcast television that i've worked on in the last uh, 20 years and the equipment that was involved with those productions so over the past decade Audio and video quality has definitely increased uh, in camera equipment. Um, this picture here, this, this just aired on the Outdoor Channel. This is a television show called Hook and Look. Um, and that's me with the blue and white hat on recording. That's a Sony uh, XD cam. Um, records in uh, 4K for this particular one. These, are, these guys are turtling, they call it. They catch uh, snapping turtles with their bare hands. And it's a fishing show, Hook and Look. These, they're, they're twins, identical twins, these two guys, and they will jump in the water and catch these big old snapping turtles. Crazy guys, but it was a lot of fun, and we do a lot of fun stuff like that. But he's taking a little quick selfie for their uh, social media. It's I was the only camera operator doing audio, um, so kind of getting into the real, real small production crews when you do some of this reality television show stuff. We'll get more to that later on. Um, but the audio and video quality has definitely increased over the years and the possibility of recording a uh, nationally syndicated television show um, even internationally can be done with very small crews so we're going to talk about that. Um, analog and standard definition have been pretty much the same since about 1941 to 2009. Um, there's a picture of me from around 2006. This was a camera we were using for uh, PBS. And even electronic field production cameras were quite large. Uh, studio cameras with the big pedestals, those were larger. The field cameras were supposed to be smaller. You can see it was still a pretty big camera. It had to sit there on your shoulder and so on. Lights were hot. Tungsten lights, you have to plug them in. They draw a lot of power. Um, they get really hot and you know you can easily trip over the wires and all that sort of stuff um, good field mixers were analog and they were expensive you got to get good sound so this was again referring to around the 2006 era and uh, resolution we were recording at the time was 720 by 480 resolution sd this was the show your brush with nature that we recorded for pbs uh, nationally syndicated and then reruns on Crate TV. We were setting them up uh, a jib here. And you can see we had about six people on crew typically for this show when we were on PBS around 2006. Um, you know, I was the director of photography um, and producer of the show. We have uh, another camera operator here, sound person, grip, uh, executive producers, um, and production assistants were our, our primary crew. Um, and sometimes we had grips to bounce lights, hide uh, stop lights from shadows and clouds and all that kind of good stuff. So grips sometimes. Um, HD TV jumped to around 2013, six times the resolution from when we were re uh, recording the previous season for PBS. Um, this season ended up internationally distributed on Netflix, uh, all over the world, hundreds of countries. Um, and then distributed on Amazon in the US, UK, and uh, other parts of the world. Cameras got a little bit smaller here. These were appropriate for uh, PBS specs at the time. And so you can see a little bit smaller size cameras and six times higher resolution for what we were recording. Now we got the 4K cameras. Um, this is a, on the left, your brush with nature and we're distributing now through Amazon for our current season. 
Um, and if you look real closely in that tree directly above my head, we're in the white shirt, little camera there in that tree, real small, 4K footage on that little thing, 24 times higher resolution than you got on those big old ENG cameras or EFP cameras. Um, just amazing, you know, the batteries were larger on those cameras than what you can get for a secondary camera just for some cutaway shots and so on. Um, these newer Sony cameras that record in 4K, they're similar in size, um, but just amazing what you can do. Uh, and then this is just a shot from the uh, Outdoor Channel Hook and Look with Kim Stricker is the host, and we'll talk more about that. But just amazing um, how much higher resolution and the latitude of the cameras. There's just so much more color information, um, and it's just amazing. Uh, but there's even 8K cameras out now for phones. And people are always, oh, I gotta get 4K or 8K or 5K or whatever. I mean, do you need 8K cameras? Um, and should you record with your cell phone? And I have people say all the time, oh, look at my new fancy phone, I can record 4K or whatever. Um, the compression is gonna be terrible. It's gonna highly compress your footage. It might look great on your phone, you know, if you're showing your friends or your kids, but once you put it on a television, it's not gonna hold up. The optics, the lenses, those are gonna be really small compared to the other lenses and the focal lengths. Um, there's a lot of reasons why the video quality is not gonna be conducive to broadcast or distribution from these cameras. So don't rely on your main camera for your cell phone. Like, oh, I can record this footage. You know, again, maybe you can get a quick little cutaway shot with your phone. Um, but don't rely on them and you don't want, you know, somebody to be messaging you in the middle of the shot and then having the camera go or whatever when you're recording. So stick away uh, from the cell phones for doing professional productions and so on. And do you really need 8K footage? Do you even really need 4K? You know, so a lot of broadcasters are, are doing the 720p still. But people are going to watch this on their cell phones primarily 2K or less. Uh, standard definition, sometimes, sometimes up to HD, depending on what kind of device you have, do you actually need to record in a lot of situations in 4K or 5K or whatever. Uh, we'll get to some reasons why you might, but I wouldn't fall for the hype of these 8K cameras, camera phones. Audio, don't overlook audio. A lot of people, when you're getting started, people use these SLR cameras or DSLR cameras. They give you a nice narrow depth of field. They're cool, but they record terrible audio. They're designed to take pictures. Maybe they threw in the video functions as uh, another option for um, audio, but the majority of that signal compression is for the pictures, not the audio. It's gonna be highly compressed. The preamps are not very good in those SLR cameras, so you need to invest in a digital field recorder. They've gone down in price quite a bit. You can get real high quality audio from these digital field recorders. Post-production editing software can automate syncing cameras and audio devices without time code. We used to have to purchase the real expensive cameras that had time code capabilities and hook all that stuff up. Um, you can easily automate the syncing or you can do it the old school way, the clap and, the, and synchronize it yourself, worst case scenario. Redundant microphones are important on set, um, you should have wireless lobs that you can click on, that's for your dialogue. Close mic um, recording for that, shotgun mics, you know, if you have enough crew, you can have somebody pointing to record more than one person. Wireless is usually one person per microphone. Shotgun, you can grab a couple people. Omnidirectionals are great if you want to capture a bunch of people at once, plop a mic in the middle of them, and you'll be good to go. Um, ambient, you got to have that ambient to help tell the story. You want to know the location, especially if you're going to do international distribution like we've done. They, they want the ambient track, and if you don't have it, you're going to have to go out and record it. Um, they're not going to accept your deliverables if you don't have that. So that's a whole nother microphone you're going to have to set up uh, and multiple recording drives and systems. We do record on hard drives these days. They could fail. They could get corrupt, so you want to have multiple devices recording just in case. Um, so definitely recommend doing that. Lights. So here's a modern myth you might have heard. 
Has anyone heard this myth? Modern cameras don't require you to set up lights because they have a wider latitude. Has anyone heard that myth? Yeah, some people are shaking their heads. All right, so here's the truth. Modern cameras do often allow for better images in lower lighting than previous digital cameras. However, you still need to set up lights to create a mood, focus the audience's attention, and allow for cleaner compression. The camera still has to convert these light waves into a digital file of some sort. And if there's more light in the scene, it's going to give you cleaner compression. You're telling stories, you're painting a picture with light. And if you're not, you're not telling your story as efficiently as you can. And you're not telling the audience, look here, or look there. You just use the house lights or whatever. So lighting is still very important. Lights have changed. There's LED lights now. Um, they've improved. They're brighter. The original ones weren't very bright. They weren't too useful besides letting you know if your VCR was turned on or whatever. Um, but now the LED lights um, are standalone units. You can adjust the intensity, how bright the lights are. You can adjust the color temperature of the lights by spinning a dial. Uh, some of them even have RGB capabilities where you can really tap in an exact color spectrum to match the other existing lights in the area or the sun if you're outdoors, shade. Um, lighter batteries powered with longer running time. When I got started, I had this big belt that I wore and they called them bricks because they were like bricks. They're heavy and they were pretty big and you'd wear two of those to power a little tungsten based light to do interviews or record stuff. Now we have these super light little LED lights. Big improvement. Um, you won't burn your finger and it, you can easily adjust it quickly. So I recommend doing that especially if you're going to be doing indoor productions or even outdoor, you know, you, you want to add some light sometimes, but primarily this is more for your indoor stuff. The good news, that old grip gear still works. There's nothing wrong with using older grip and rigging equipment as long as it's in working order, of course. Uh, reflectors can still bounce light. I love those outdoors. You use those all the time. Um, flags can still block light. Scrims lower intensity, diffusion softens lights and lowers intensity, and gels still change color temperature. So if you didn't buy the latest RGB LED lights, the older lights work, throw some scrims, throw some gels in front of it, you can balance them quickly. Um, that stuff is still great. So you can use that stuff if you still have it, or you might be able to get a good deal on it. If someone's trying to get rid of it, they want to get the new. Um, LED lights or whatever, this is a good option. Use that old grip gear, especially if you invested in stuff like jibs and things like that. Um, those things are great. Video assist. It's beneficial to see a full resolution image from your camera on a reference monitor. Many cameras, viewfinders, and LCD screens do not display all the pixels and your image may actually be recording soft. Has anybody in here ever recorded uh, video? And they're like, oh, this looks great. And then they go home and they see that it's soft. Yeah, it sees some the heads nodding. That's because these little screens don't show you the full resolution. Um, so it's good to have a bigger monitor somewhere on set where you can see, is it actually in focus? You can use guides like peaking and digitally zoom in to adjust your focus and things like that. But video assist is great. The other reason with autofocus, there's some problems with it. It has improved over the years but it doesn't know, do you want me to focus on the background or your talent? Especially, some of you probably think of composition when you're recording, rule of thirds, stuff like that, right? Well, the middle of your screen is probably what your camera wants to focus on, and that's gonna be the background. So, the autofocus doesn't know what to focus on unless you control it, um, and so you still need to consider uh, focusing, video assist can help with that. Some monitors offer video display and recording to a hard drive in a single package. And you can record in different formats, like RAW and all this and that. We'll get to that. So that's another nice option to have, um, is to have those little monitors. But honestly, a lot of those monitors don't actually record. Or they record a higher resolution than they show you. So you get into that same problem. You're recording this raw footage at 4 or 5K, 
what they're showing you in HD image. So I prefer myself to have a bigger monitor that is in 4K or whatever resolution that we're recording in so you can actually see. So one of the crazy things I like to do and get into is underwater cinematography and you're probably wondering why I have the water in the background the whole time and stuff. Well, this is it here. These smaller cameras, they have allowed us to be more safe underwater um, and to get into different areas, um, do high resolution recording. These images here on the right were from uh, Lake Huron. And that's with the LED light. It was pitch black inside of that ship there. There was a burbot hiding inside of the engine room there. Um, but these LED depth rated batteries can do wonders. When you go down, you lose light very quickly. You start to lose your reds and your oranges and yellows. So you just end up with green, you get deeper, it's just blues. So you gotta add light so you can see and so you can return some colors to your shots. And so here are some images here. Um, adding the color back, like you can see the, the seahorse here on the left. Without that light on, that would just be blue. Um, you wouldn't be able to see any of those yellow and orangish colors, um, the red colors. And the thing I love about doing outdoor photography and nature photography is when you get to capture things like going out and then seeing wildlife and seeing, oh, there's brain coral. I know that cleaner rats hang out around those. And then being able to capture nice close macro shots of those little cleaner rats and then seeing fish swim up and seeing the cleaner rats clean them um, and capturing that sequence. It's just uh, something amazing to be able to do with these small compact cameras. Um, and this one is the Icolite housing that I was using. Um, I do some scuba stuff for aquatic adventures. I'm a, a dive ambassador for them. And so I do a lot of different stuff um, throughout Michigan. This one was in on Honduras, but I get to dive all over the place. Um, so this was that particular camera. This is the Hook and Luck TV show. Uh, and that's a really cool show. The host, Kim Stricker, he goes underwater as well with a camera. Um, that's a gate housing that he has there. And um, it's an educational show. It's a fishing show, it teaches you how to fish, but also there's always something educational about it. Actually, just last year at ICAST, um, um, we got awards for best underwater video and best educational programming out of like 200 or so programs or so that were up. So that was pretty awesome. Um, but we have wireless communication systems that we're able to use. And so uh, there was a guest on that show, that was the VP of Outdoor Channel. We were in Minnesota for this episode, and that's his hometown. So he came on set and was a guest, so it's cool to have him. And you can see the headset that he's wearing. You can talk to the diver below. Um, and a lot of times I'll be steering the boat with my feet there and doing camera and talking to him, making sure boats don't come by and you know following his bubbles and this and that. Um, and so he can talk to me, I'm recording his audio, and then we can both be in the water and talk to each other as well to record. Because um, that part of the show is he shows a fish and we got to show him. And then he's fishing, we go out there and then he's got to find the fish and it's like tournament mode. Find where they are, catch them. We almost have to do the show twice, you know, it's like some behind the scenes stuff. Um, then we got to get in the water and he's got to catch them again, but we got to capture it on video. So when you see the show, you see, you know, the lure come down and the fish. I mean, it's so it's like basically doing it twice. It's a lot of work, but it's, it's a lot of fun. But these underwater communication systems allow us to talk to each other underwater or from um, surface to underwater. It's uh, a, a lot different than back in the Jacques Cousteau days with the cables running around with the lights and everything. Um, we can get into thick matted areas where bats like to hang out and do all kinds of cool stuff where that wouldn't be as possible if you had cables tethering you all over the place. So that has definitely helped the process. Um, recording all these different programs. Um, we record outdoors in harsh weather. This was for your brush with nature uh, last winter. It was below freezing here. And so, of course, when you're in the elements, you got to wear sunscreen and wear layers and bug spray and stuff like that. 
Uh, but protect your fingers, allow for dexterity. You can see I got these little mechanic gloves for turning knobs, things like that. Um, but sometimes you got to stick your fingers in your pockets or double up gloves so you can do that. Another thing people don't think about often is you got to protect your batteries. It's cold out, they're going to lose their juice really fast on you unless you protect them. So you can see here our uh, camera operator on the right here, Eric, he's got uh, protection around that battery sticking out of the back of the camera to keep it warm. And so I'm more likely to use the hand warmers to warm up the camera than I am for myself. You know, we always have them around and I never really use them because I'm just too focused on, on what's going on. But protect your fingers, protect your batteries. You're not going to have as much time to record. Bring extra batteries, of course, for when they die if you don't have power. Um, protect your microphones. You can see we have the shotgun microphones on the left. They call those different terms from dead cat to wombat to um, there's a blimp on the field recorder. I have on that top little picture there with a dead cat around that. Um, so that can help protect the wind, of course, from your microphone. So you got to do that, uh, rugged field equipment. Um, protect your lens. You start recording, it starts raining. That's what those hoods are for. You can hold anything up to keep it off, but eventually you might need to get a rain jacket or something like this that I have on the right, unless you have a full underwater system and you want to use that. But that just gets clunky and it's, it's annoying to have to do that if you're on land. So you might want to get a, a little raincoat there for your camera. Why not, right? Those things are worth money. Uh, aerial photography. Zach already talked about this quite a bit, so I'm not going to talk about it mu much. Unmanned aircraft systems is the official FAA term for that, but everyone calls them drones, even though they're not drones. Drones are like military woo things, but that's a whole other topic. They do require licenses, and there's all kinds of other things you need to do for commercial operations. So if you're going to just play around with it, that's fine, but once you start charging money, you do have to have a pilot in command and other things like that. Um, I think that they're great for establishing shots. Uh, I don't think that they're great to use for a whole production. Use them for a couple seconds per show. Um, depends on what you're doing. If you're doing real estate photography or you're doing a historic thing or something like that, that's awesome, that's cool. But for regular television shows, um, it's a shot. It's an establishing shot, it's a live shot. Uh, maybe a couple of quick shots to help tell the story or a transition, um, but I wouldn't overuse those shots. So now we have YouTube and we have live streaming. Um, there's all sorts of videos on YouTube, anything from how-to videos, monologues, people playing video games, you know, yelling, ah, yelling at the screen. A lot of people watch that, believe it or not to independent and commercial content releases. So there's everything on there on YouTube. Now virtually anyone can distribute videos and live stream versus the days of just strictly broadcast cinema releases and retail releases. You gotta go get the VHS videos or DVDs or whatever. Um, everybody's a superstar now, so there's a lot of competition out there. There's a lot of services to distribute, like Vimeo, YouTube, um, Twitch are some of the main ones. Also, social media can do live streaming now, and you can use that for promotion. Promote your media, promote your show, whatever your gig is, you can promote it. So there's that aspect of it. And you can stream to people's cell phones, to their computers, or even to their televisions. Smart TVs have it built in. You can plug in PlayStations and other devices uh, that can play uh, live streams and YouTube content. So there's a lot of options out there for distribution. Formats. Now we're getting into the super exciting stuff. Um, there are many new formats that expand the quality and options of post-production. Some of the categories are RAW, LOG, HDR, and then you have the compressed formats. Compressed meaning you know like you have your MPEGs, H.264, AVIs, MOV, QuickTime, all that sort of stuff where your compressed format. So we do not have enough time to go over all these different formats, but those are some of the different categories of formats depending on the level of 
your deliverable requirements, you might need to distribute a log format or raw format or so on. Each require a different process when you're recording. For example, um, the raw footage, you're, it's, you're not going to see it. You have to convert it. Log, it's going to be gray. So you might have to use a LUT lookup table to see it on a reference monitor. Um, there's different exposure preferences. Instead of making it look perfect, you might want it to look muted and so on. So you've got to do that research ahead of time. See what format distribution requires. Every distribution company requires something different, which I'll get to on the next slide. But that is going to dictate what format you record in. Test the full pipeline, though. Say, OK, there's this new suite, Alexa camera. I'm going to go rent it. We're going to record it. And then I'm going to edit it. Like, no, get it record a test, uh, edit it, and go to the whole deliverable format. And then run that through your scopes and whatever. Make sure that you're going to meet the specifications before you actually begin production. It's called screen test. So do the whole pipeline before you actually get on set. Um, if most of your audience is watching your video on YouTube and cell phones, you may not need to splurge on the cinema camera packages with log and HDR coding and all that. So again, where is your target audience going to be viewing this? You might be able to save some money, rendering time. Um, there's a lot of reasons why you might not need to go the whole cinema camera package. So take a look at that. But again, it, it all depends on how you're distributing your show. Um, so we're on Netflix here. They had a whole set of deliverables for distribution, which was different than Amazon USA. Amazon India was actually more strict of what they wanted than Amazon uh, in the US and UK. So that was interesting. By the way, Netflix has real strict requirements for Netflix originals, but if you are producing something on your own, the requirements are different. So that's something else to see. Some people get intimidated when they see, oh, I have to have this camera or that. Well, that's if you're going to do a comedy special and so on. So it depends on what material you're going to create. PBS has a red book that always changes in every foreign market. We were in North Africa, Middle East, they all require different specifications for broadcast of different sound mixes that have M and E stems. So if you know that stuff ahead of time, you know what to record, keep it on your hard drives, get it ready. You never know down the road how you can distribute your content. Support systems. Tripods and monopods still help stabilize your cameras. You, especially if you have an older tripod, it was probably built for a bigger, heavier camera. Well, there you go. You're good to go. You can still use that stuff. Electronic 3-axis gimbals have gone down in price and are available for full size to action camera size. The drones have those things built in. So what that means is you move the camera like this and the gimbal balances it out so that it's perfectly good to go. Um, the motorized options mean you can program it to move back and forth, the dolly and tilt, all that stuff. Cameras built in image stabilization has dramatically improved both optical and uh, digital stabilization. Post production, you can do it in post, fix it in post. Um, that's also improved, easier, works well. Combination of techniques can work together. So don't just rely on one technique. You know, try to fix it at the top, and then if you have to, you can fix it in post or so on. Um, but yeah, there's some jibs here. That's a 30 foot jib that I was using for, uh, it's called First Snow in the Woods. That was a, a real nice project we did. Um, and then, yeah, another hook and look episode in your brush for nature there. But yeah, that equipment still works. One man band. Less crew means a lower budget. You want to do your passion projects. Um, your client doesn't have as much money, you know, can you do it with one person as a videographer and so on? Um, yeah, you can kind of do it. Less crew might mean something might get overlooked. So if you're sitting there focusing the camera, what about your audio? What happens to your audio? What about continuity? You know, what's happening in the background? Um, so there can be some downsides to having a small crew. But with more crew, someone might accidentally change a setting in a different way than the director's vision wants. There's a lot of, of negative things that could happen as well with a larger crew. You got more cooks in the kitchen, right? So that's uh, another downside, but it is possible to record with smaller crews these days. Graphics are important. 
professional productions need custom graphics. Um, clients don't want to pay to see the same templates and filters their niece and nephews are using on their phones, right? So you got to do something else to impress them. Freelancers and production companies must be well-rounded in their ability to create graphics and animations. There's a, and we did for Bad Luck Bananas, it's a visual effect based demonstration we did. You can find it on YouTube. Um, Kim Stricker was hosting on that where we brought this little puppet to life from the 80s of Boggling. So check that out. That was a fun thing that we did. But yeah, I had to make promotional materials for that and for your brush for nature and so on. So, you know, learn the basics, Photoshop, Illustrator, um, 3ds Max, stuff like that. Sound, post-production. Just because you capture high quality audio in the field doesn't mean you don't have to mix and master the sound. These professional digital audio workstations are more affordable, so you can get them. You don't have to get all the huge expensive hardware anymore either. You need music. It helps set the mood. We have original scores for your brush with nature, always Dan Belleville. Um, wrote most of the music. I did a couple pieces here and there, but primarily he did that. It helps set the mood. Sound effects and ambience are critical to portraying the world. If you just record your talent, you know, that's boring. You're not going to be able to communicate the whole spectrum of where they're at, what's happening. So you need to do that post. There's different processing you can do to meet um, broadcast standards as well if you're going that route. So don't forget about that. And so a lot of you are here because you want to expand, you want to grow. Social media can help, but there's a lot of noise on social media. Everybody's trying to sell something. They got their own agendas. There's trolls all over the place, as they call them. Um, so you can use that as a process, but I find traditional schools to begin your career or quickly expand in relevant ones. Um, they have instructors that have been doing it for a long time. They have filtered out all the noise. They'll get you up to speed quickly. You're collaborating with other people, bouncing off ideas, and you got a crew there. You're at home, you want to do your projects, you got to buy equipment, you go to a traditional school. Um, that is something that you can get up to more quickly and not have to invest all that money and so on. There are some online resources, which that can be okay as an accompaniment, but again, everyone's trying to sell something. They got their agendas. Network with professionals and nonprofits like Michigan Production Alliance. We do different sorts of presentations like this um, throughout the years and have networking events and all kinds of fun activities. Detroit ACM SIGGRAPH is uh, another organization that's specifically involved with graphics that I'm currently chairing. Um, so we do similar sorts of things. Become a production assistant. Get on set any way you can. See how things are being done now. Things were done differently 10 years ago and five years ago, whatever, everything's changing. So get on set, you'll get some experience that way. Uh, and if you want to do your own things, participate in a 48 hour film challenge. We do the Schoolcraft Film Challenge uh, every fall around Veterans Day. And when you make a film in a weekend, you learn a lot about yourself and the process and what can go wrong and you improve. And it's a lot of fun and you get to do your passion projects as well. You can do whatever genres you want um, so that's another reason why I highly recommend to grow uh, in this industry, to do something like that. You want to have fun every once in a while. So here are my final tips. Learn the art of the craft, not the act of buying. There's always something new coming out, more pixels and this and that. Who cares? What do you actually need? What do you don't need? Um, there's an the old school slate clapper right there. That's all we need. They have the electronic ones that you can sync on your phone. and all kinds, of, you don't need it. The, you can sync the cameras and post anyways. That's basically just a backup. So that's just an example. Um, make content that's worth sharing. There's a lot of stuff out there. Do something original. Do what you're passionate about. Me, I'm passionate about the outdoors, the environment, um, education, teaching people about painting. Uh, your brush with nature is a planner painting television show where we teach you how to paint. Hook and look was about fishing and about wildlife and different things like that. But do something that you're passionate about. Um, do something original. There's a lot of remakes and stuff, which they can be okay sometimes with the nostalgia. But do something different. Faster isn't always better. You can record a video on your phone, but is that better? You can add a filter on your phone. 
Um, color correction is still key. Get in there, get a colors to do that, learn how to do it yourself. Back up your data. We're not working on films or tapes anymore. Hard drives get corrupt. If you drop it, um, your pet can knock it over. Have extra copies of it, even on set after you record. You should have a backup right away. Always learn something new. We are in the technology business. Technology is always changing, so learn something new. Otherwise, the world's going to keep moving. You're going to stay there. Or like, you know, the glaciers, they're melting. And if you stick on that piece of ice, you're going to drown. You've got to swim for a minute. The next piece of ice, it'll probably come around. But if you just stay there, you're going to get wet and cold. So look for that uh, new opportunity. Learn something. Everybody learns something new all the time or you're not going to make it. Any questions? I know I went through a lot of information real quick. Wanted to hit you over the head with a lot of great stuff. So I appreciate you guys coming out here. Did you have a question? Yeah, I was just going to, if you could make, uh, mention a few things. Uh, yeah. The biggest differences between, say, TV, you know, news gathering versus some of the production stuff. You know, you mentioned, like, ambient sound recording. And what are some of the main differences that you're like, okay, this is a lot different than, you know, what a TV production would be? So, yeah, for a new situation, and they really made their crews smaller, too. It used to be cameraman and a talent, and I hear a lot of these smaller markets now. The talent is basically doing selfie news, and you watch it on, and obviously they're not holding it like that, but they're putting on a tripod, they're turning on a light, they're doing their own audio. So for that, yeah, it's really more about the just the themselves, and maybe the, they have an omni microphone so you can hear some of the traffic or the people honking their horns, the riot going on. Whatever's going on, you can pick up that ambience with that microphone versus if you're doing something for um, reality shows or so on, then yeah, you might have to set up more microphones to capture more people and so on. But for doing news, you just basically want, or the handhelds, the person that you're talking to, not everyone in the background that's cheering and hollering or crying or whatever. So you have that control. I've done lots of interviews, thousands of interviews, um, and the handheld microphones work great. I wasn't talking about that stuff today, but handheld microphone, you're controlling the audio, you do it quick, bring the camera and you go back and forth and that's your mixer live mixing is right here you set the level at the beginning you leave it alone this is how you mix when you're live and you're doing news or doing other things like that it's changing the distance to your talent you're not changing knobs and stuff like that it's going to make your background go it's going to sound terrible any other questions yeah what's your video uh, honestly, it just really depends, and I, I don't really think you need to go get a real expensive reference monitor, because again, what your audience going to be looking at, and I actually like to have, when I edit, consumer monitor, you know, higher quality monitor, the monitors to work on when I'm doing post-production, because I do my own post-production. Um, so I don't think you need to necessarily have a particular brand, but even some of those like $2,000 reference monitors, they're only shoot in HD. So what's the point? You know, you can get a real cheap consumer monitor and see 4K. I don't, that's my personal preference. Um, you know, I'll probably get in trouble for saying that. But what do you use? What do you get? I just like again. I just use consumer television sets. You know, so it's cheaper, and it depends on what the client has. I work on stuff where we we have had you know bigger things and so on, but that's not what the consumer is using. And my thing is, if you can make it good on set and on location, then you're good to go and you can save time in post-production. But I always color correct everything, always have to make levels legal and help set the mood and do whatever else you need to do for storytelling. Um, but yeah, I, I don't get too caught up in the equipment, especially when you're on a boat. Like and you can see, it gets real clustered. Sometimes it's just me and Kim Stricker. Sometimes we have a camera boat. So I'll be on the camera boat sometimes and we can put, you know, two sets of scuba gear and cameras um, and then all the different sorts of systems we use for recording on. There's a lot of freaking stuff. There's um, room under the boat, but we have to minute our, our stuff. So that's why you have to use other stuff like peaking, digitally zoom in. Um, you have to rely on the camera sometimes. You know, the scopes help and your eyes help a little bit, especially when you're shooting outdoors. You got the sun shining on your LCD screen, shining in your eyes sometimes. Um, yeah. 
Any other questions? All right, well, thanks for coming out and listening to us. Come back here. We have that raffle coming up. We're going to be giving away some cool stuff. And we have some other real cool presentations coming up. Wally's going to be talking about um, doing uh, different sorts of producing and funding, budgeting and stuff. So I'm interested to learn about that more. That's coming up at what time? 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock we'll be in here. And then at 3 o'clock, I believe, is the next one, right, Mark? At 3 o'clock, we're going to do... Uh, Mark Adler is going to be talking about production, algebra, getting into the biz, and what to expect your first day on the set, and other sorts of uh, interesting things. So check us out online. Again, we have brochures there um, for the Michigan Production Alliance, social media, and all that good stuff. And enjoy the rest of your time um, at the Great Lakes Media Show. Thank you.